Hello YouTubers and fellow hams. Well, this is my uh, doublet antenna video. Now, uh, one thing that I'm enjoying being out here in the RV in the desert is room. Uh, I spent most of my ham life in a city, on a small city lot, and I had just no options for antennas. But out here in the desert, I've got kind of a little antenna farm going on out here next to the RV. We, of course, have the big 60-foot mast up with a vertical wire running up it and uh, various antennas on the RV, a short vertical, the uh, two-meter Slim Jim. And the recent addition is a doublet antenna. You can see from one leg here up to the mast. Now, the doublet is an antenna that um, I've wanted to play with for a very long time. It is a non-resonant, multi-band, single dipole antenna. It, re it requires the use of an antenna tuner, but it makes about the most efficient use of a tuned single dipole sort of setup that you could have due to one key factor. It's fed with ladder line or window line, parallel feeders. And if the antenna is balanced, and I, I mean it's fed at the center, so you've got sy symmetry across, and then the parallel line coming down, you virtually eliminate feed line loss. And we'll look at that when we look closer at the design of the antenna. So um, it's a multi-band uh, antenna with the tuner, um, and performance is really good on all the bands. Now, myself, one of my earliest antennas that I built when I first became a ham was a coaxial-fed dipole resonant for 40 meters, I think. You know, and that worked pretty well. Um, I built an antenna tuner, and I could tune it to operate on the bands above um, in frequency, 40 meters, you know, 20 meters, 15 meters, 10 meters. And uh, I wasn't able to make contacts, you know, but I did notice that it seemed to get a little deafer as I, as I moved up in frequency. The signals were down, um, and I couldn't be heard as well. And the main reason for that is the standing waves that set up on a non-resonant antenna uh, when they go down an unbalanced feeder like coax, uh, you have a great deal of loss. And there's a lot of technical information about that in an article that I'm going to share for you uh, that you can read up on if you want to learn more about how that works. But what we care about is, in this video, is there is loss when you feed a non-resonant antenna with coax. Feeding it with ladder line, you virtually eliminate that loss and eventually the power, most all of the power ends up on the antenna wires and, and radiates. And, and so you have a fairly high uh, performing antenna, even though it's non-resonant. So let's go uh, to the computer and let's look at the design of a doublet. I went through a lot of material while looking for information on the doublet and researching it. And I settled on a couple of uh, sources to include for this video. First is a web page on webclass.org. Um, written by L.B. Sibic, W4RNL, All Band Doublet, and it's a very nice little page. Uh, it covers the doublet design and talks about it in fairly plain language. Just about anybody should be able to follow this and learn about the doublet. It will be linked in the description below, uh, and he talks about uh, current distributions on uh, the antennas, um, he gives some examples and graphs and lots of information about the doublet, recommended lengths, plots for radiation. I mean, it's, it's a very nice, informative site. We'll be referring to a couple of pieces of it in here. Um, and that'll be linked in the description below. I'm also going to be uh, drawing upon a more um, technical document on orarc.net multiband centerfed zep.pdf. The doublet was also called a, a centerfed zep, um, which yeah, may or may not be totally accurate, but it's a, it's a common uh, label for the antenna. We'll be referring to some information out of there as well. But uh, first off, let's just go and look at the design of the doublet. And this is the basic design of the doublet antenna. Now, it is, as we said earlier, a basically a dipole antenna. Um, you have a leg here and a leg there. 
and uh, those two combine to produce the actual antenna element, and then they are fed at the center with uh, twin lead, feed, uh, ladder line, window line, and some kind of parallel feeder, and then an antenna tuner to match it to 50 ohms for your transceiver. Real simple. Uh, the antenna tuner is required, and it's required uh, for even the bands that the antenna is resonant at if you cut it to a resonant length. Uh, speaking of the length, the overall length of the antenna up here, you uh, can be any length you want. The only factor you have to consider is the lowest frequency that you can use it at is going to be a little bit below its half wavelength. So if you want to use it on 80 meters, you got to be close to 126 feet in length. I mean, you can be shorter. You can be a little bit shorter. Another nice thing with the doublet is it will perform pretty well uh, to a frequency down um, a little ways below its half wavelength. Uh, so you can, you can be a little short. So you can cut it 110 feet and it'll work great on 80 meters um, all the way down the band, in fact. Uh, since it's using an antenna tuner um, for everything, it's uh, basically uh, almost a linear antenna all the way up uh, in frequency, maybe as high as 6 meters. Um, from the uh, half wavelength frequency on up, you should be able to um, tune it with the tuner. There might be some spots where it'll give you some difficulty, but it would be a good antenna option for somebody doing MARS, um, military affiliated radio service, where they need to jump around in frequencies outside of the amateur bands. It should be able to do that. Uh, so, cut, a, cut as much wire as you can put up, feed it with ladder line. Now, the ladder line needs to come to an antenna tuner. And many antenna tuners, uh, for example, this I think is an MFJ, but a lot of them are built like this, will have um, open wire feeder connections out here uh, for this high impedance ladder line or window line. And those go directly into a ballon on the inside of usually a 4 to 1 ballon that brings the high impedance uh, present on the feed line down to something closer to 50 ohms where the tuner's uh, circuitry can then match that to 50 ohms for your radio. And uh, loss in tuners uh, depends upon the mismatch. The greater the mismatch, the more loss you'll have in the tuner. So uh, this ballon, this transformer here, is bringing the uh, hundreds of ohms of impedance present on the feeder uh, down to something closer to 50 ohms so that the uh, match being created by the tuner is going to be a little bit closer or a little it's going to have to do less work basically the tuner the tuner circuitry is going to have to do less work and you'll have less loss in the tuner so it's more efficient um, the problem is getting that ladder line to your tuner uh, window line cannot be run next to anything metal uh, you could run it down the leg of a tower if it stood off, I think, by two or three feet. I mean, it really has to be stood off away from the tower a ways. So getting it into the house can be a problem. Uh, there is an option, though, and I've run across this on several other sites, too, and this is the method that I'm using here at the RV. The parallel feed line from your antenna comes in, and you would put a four-to-one ballon out here, external to the wall, where you can run the more convenient coax in through the wall to an antenna tuner. Uh, this method could also be used with an external ballon. If you have an antenna tuner, like I have, the LDG Z11 Pro does not have a high impedance input. It only has a 50 ohm coaxial input. Um, and it is important to keep that coax run as short as possible because this is going to be your loss here on this coax. From the uh, ballon to the tuner, you're going to have standing wave ratio loss on this coax. Um, so keep that as short as possible. You know, if it's only two or three feet, you're not going to have much loss, and you're still going to have the advantage of the long parallel feed line up to the antenna wires with almost no loss. And speaking of that, uh, let's go and look at some data from the web page I mentioned. This is a table of uh, loss, and he compares um, 100 ohm coax, 100 feet of RG8X, which is pretty good coax, to 100 feet of a 450 ohm window line. And I've covered the, fi the uh, figures on the window line here for, for a moment, because I want to show you how this is working. 
Um, this is the frequency. Uh, he had a 135 foot doublet, which is a little bit long, but it's about 80 meters. Yeah, 75, 80 meter band. So it should be a fairly good match. Um, and the uh, approximate impedance uh, uh, when fed with uh, coax, uh, the SWR was 1.4 to 1, and the loss on the coax was only 0.6 dB. Um, now, that's the best case. You know, you've got a really close match on impedance here, so you've got a low SWR, so you don't have too, too much in the way of standing waves. They're there, but there's not, they're, not, they're, not that, they're not that strong. So loss is low on the coax. But if we go to a different frequency, like let's say 60 meters here, okay? Um, a very high impedance. An SWR of 69 to 1. And that results in a loss on the coax of a whopping 7.7 .7 dB. So the, you can see the correlation here between SWR and loss. The higher the SWR due to mismatch, the higher the loss on the coax. So how does it look over here on the window line? We can see on coax we have as much as, a, as 11 dB loss here, 10, 10 dB loss. I mean, that's a lot of loss. How does it look on the window line? <laughs> how about that? <laughs> in, the, in this case here with the strong mismatch on 40 meters, 11.3 dB loss uh, with 100 feet of coax 0.5 dB loss uh, with window line in the same case. So as you can see right here, uh, there's virtually no loss on the window line. You know, one, one thing that's made, that I was curious about is why is that? Um, you know, why is there so little loss on the window line? Well, let's take a look at the PDF that I'm going to um, link here in the description because he does talk about that. And he talks about it up here. Uh, Okay, there we go. Uh, suppose there's an impedance mismatch at the antenna feed point. Uh, some RF energy will be reflected back down the coax. Half the reflected current will flow on the center conductor, half on the outer conductor, but the inside of it. The reflected RF currents, however, may also flow on the outside surface of the coax. And these will induce an electromagnetic field, and the currents will be unbalanced by any countervailing field. Um, what, he's, what he's talking about there, if you think about coax, uh, when RF is being travel, is traveling down coax, it's traveling on the outside of the inner conductor and the inside of the shield. And the currents are opposed, so they cancel each other, so you don't get a, an electromagnetic field off the coax. Um, and that's in a, you know, a, good, a good situation. When you have a mismatch and you have standing waves, um, currents flowing on the outside surface of the coax don't have any opposing currents on another conductor out there to cancel them. And so uh, because of that, the uh, RF will be on the outer, outside of the coax. It'll radiate and you'll lose power there as well. So that means that, uh, as he put it here, radiation from the coax means less energy reaching and being radiated by the antenna itself. So loss. Now on the balanced feeder, no matter what's going on with standing waves, um, even the reflected RF currents will be on the two wires. And just like the incident RF currents will be of equal magnitude and opposite polarity, so they cancel each other out and no electromagnetic field uh, will be formed around the feed line, no loss. And that means that there will, well, as he says here, there'll be no RF radiation from parallel wire transmission line and nearly all of the transmitted RF power will eventually reach the antenna, even if it's bouncing back and forth on the feed line. So that's why there's no loss on parallel um, feed line, uh, and also why most of your power gets out there. So that's interesting. This uh, PDF has a lot of, of really valuable information in it, so make sure you check it out. Okay, so uh, there we can see that there's... Oh, hardly any loss on window line. That's where the efficiency of the doublet comes in. Um, even if it's mismatched with the, the antenna wires, you still get most of your power up to the antenna. Okay, so let's talk about my build of the antenna. Uh, I'm going to be doing a four to one balance going through 
a 50 ohm feeder on the side of the RV. So first I had to cut some material to build the antenna itself with. And I used what was left of the uh, 88 cent cutting board that I bought at Walmart. I'll be getting another one. And then I had to drill some holes after I'd figured out where I was going to put the wires and, and such on the two pieces. The piece for the middle of the antenna and the uh, ballon itself. Now this is an experimental setup. So the uh, ballon is just sort of a temporary build onto a, a piece of uh, plastic that was a cutting board. Um, I did test the ballon after I wound it. I put a, a 200 ohm resistor on its output, swept it with the VNA, and it was flat across the HF spectrum. And it's uh, got a short piece of coax and a uh, PL259 connector on there. This is just an experimental test antenna. It's not going to be permanently put up, so I don't mind uh, letting the uh, PL259 hold the strain of the feed line. There won't be much weight. Here's the finished center of the antenna. Uh, just a flat piece of uh, plastic cutting board with uh, the window line attached firmly to it and the wires wrapped through holes and then soldered to the window line. Uh, a little hole at the top to hang it from the uh, top of the mast with. Now I did pull it up onto the mast and I had to measure out um, the feed line uh, to the RV before I uh, uh, put the uh, 4 to 1 on the end of it. Um, so uh, I had to get that line measured and cut so it would just just reach the antenna. The length of the feed line isn't critical. Uh, you don't have to have it a specific length or too sh or certain. Um, you don't have to be too short. You can be a little long. It doesn't matter. Uh, there's Like I said, there's no loss or radiation on it. Uh, so that is pretty much the completed antenna. Um, here's a couple of pictures. The uh, antenna hanging from the mast. Uh, the uh, 4 to 1 ballon just outside the RV. So that's the basic theory and ideas behind the doublet, um, the uh, design and build that I did for mine. Uh, this video was getting kind of long, and uh, I decided that I wanted to make uh, um, a, make it a two-parter. So the second part to this series will be operation of the antenna. We'll be using it, we'll be uh, looking at it on the air, um, and uh, making some contacts on it in different modes and such, whisper, and, and we'll do some other stuff. Uh, the, also, the other reason that I wanted to do it um, as a two-parter is because I have a kit I want to build. And that kit is a 700 milliwatt CW transceiver. Very low power. Uh, so I want to use that on the doublet as well and uh, make a contact hopefully with it. Um, so that'll be, part, that'll be included in part two. So there you go. Um, that's a theory design look at the doublet and uh, my build of it. And uh, we'll see you in part two. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you're not already a subscriber, click to subscribe. Join us on the Facebook channel for discussion about the videos. And if you'd like to help support this channel, please click to support me on my Patreon page.